uh, okay, it looks like people are starting to come over. Um, so, yeah, uh, what I'm going to do since we're running a little behind is I'm just going to go ahead and get right into the updates. Um, and as people come in, hopefully uh, they'll get it sorted. And go ahead and share out these numbers. So hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, we're over 52,000 total cases in the state of Florida. Uh, when we drill down to Pinellas, we're over almost almost 1,200 cases, um, 75 deaths, um, a lot more hospitalizations. DR age range is very, very broad here. Um, still have a slight female predominance, not sure where that is. Um, we do have uh, currently um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 35 to 40 people in our intensive care units and another 120 to 130 people hospitalized in, within uh, Pinellas County. Um, so we still, still do continue to have a significant burden of disease here uh, in Pinellas County. For those that want to keep up on the numbers, there you go. So um, like most people are joining over. Any questions about the numbers, guys, or what they mean, or what you're hearing uh, in terms of uh, testing or anything else? Not yet. All right. Um, good. So why don't we just, Peter, I don't, don't want to hand it off to you until we've got a few more people here. So. Okay. Yeah. Peggy, are you here today? Should I play some music while we wait? It's looking good. All right, um, so those are the basic numbers for today. Um, you guys had asked last week uh, if we could talk a little bit about the pediatric inflammatory syndrome uh, that's going on. It's had a couple of different names so far, I think. Uh, what are we calling it now, Dr. Antebi? Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome. Is there an acronym for that? I mean, they're calling it like, you know, MI-S. It has no good acronym, I don't think. Oh, this is terrible. Yeah. Uh, horrible. Yeah. So, um, Pinellas Medic, what do you, which case studies or reviews are you talking about? Can you be a little more specific? Uh, and then, okay, so is this a, is this a big thing? Is this a little thing? Are we seeing a lot of this, Peter? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's very rare. Um, if you look at the total number of cases that have occurred throughout the country that you just put up on the board, well, that was for Florida. If you, look, if you look at the millions of people who have been infected, the number of children who, are, who have been infected is uh, much lower than that. And then you're hearing about the big numbers of uh, this inflammatory syndrome occurring in New York that had over 100 cases. Um, I've been kind of following around Florida. I mean, uh, I've only heard of, at least in, in our neck of the woods here, a handful of them. I have friends where I trained in LA. They only have a handful there. I think you guys may have a couple on the West Coast, if I'm understanding correctly. Um, and it's, it's very rare. I mean, I had made a couple of slides to show people what it looks like, if you want me to share my screen. But it's, I think we did hear this morning, though, that there was a reasonable number of these cases in Paris as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that is true. Um, it could be that people just are kind of never associated or never linked it together because Today was the first time that we heard that from Pierre in Paris this morning. Um, but I mean, most of us know this as, as Kawasaki disease, right? Uh, this, this occurs um, after the illness. We never knew what Kawasaki disease came from. There was always a link to it. But actually, I did some research on SARS and MERS, which are also coronavirus, as you guys know. Um, and there was a paper from 2004, 2005, that actually looked at kids who actually had those coronaviruses. And I think the number was, I have, I have the study up here. Uh, let me just bring it up on my screen. Um, they basically looked at those illnesses and 
and 72%, so eight out of 11 children, developed what they call then Kawasaki disease after they developed the other coronavirus. So th this has been described years ago. This study is from the Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2005. Um, and again, so this, this is actually not an unknown phenomenon. And so the fact that it's happened again is not uncommon. I just think now that people are linking the two together. And there also seemed to be a little bit of discussion as to whether this is a parallel to the cytokine storm that people were seeing when when folks progressed from yeah. pneumonia to ARDS. Is, is that something that you put any credence in or not really? Um, listen, I mean, the fact that I, I mean, I haven't treated one of these kids myself personally. So, but from all the reports that we're reading, um, it, it just looks like a massive inflammatory response. But as, as most of you know, in Kawasaki's, the whole course of Kawasaki, let's start with that first, is that if you didn't treat Kawasaki's within the first 10 days, right? If you have a kid who comes in, the parents have that fever, they have red eyes, they have a rash, they have like red lips, they have a big lymph node, all the signs of Kawasaki's, even if you sent that kid home, you missed it in day one, two, three, four, five, it was okay. What happened with Kawasaki is that you had to figure it out before day 10. And why is day 10 important? Is because if you missed it and you didn't give them the treatment, which I'll talk about in a minute, you ended up affecting their coronary arteries and you end up getting coronary aneurysms. And those kids had a chance of dying after the inflammatory process happened. And the treatment was aspirin and IVIG. And so with Kawasaki's, we knew that if we treated them within the first 10 days, they wouldn't die. And true today, very few kids die from Kawasaki's because uh, the astute clinician will pick it up. Um, there are very few cases that you'll hear about where the kid dies and then you know the doctors get sued um, you know, for, for millions of dollars. Um, with this particular case, I've been asking my colleagues out there, are you treating this the same way as Kawasaki's? And I think that the jury is out but most people indeed are you know, still giving IVIG. Uh, I've been asking my colleagues in the adult world, are you giving the adults IVIG for this massive cytokine response? And so far I've heard a big no, or I don't know. But um, I do think it's an inflammatory response. I do think the cytokines are, are, are at play here, but um, the jury's still out. So the CDC put together a working group I think a doctor in New York put together a group so that all these cases could then be put into one single database. And I think as the time goes by and we get more specific details on each of these cases and how they were treated, then I think we'll have more information. But if it was me treating a child, I would treat them like Kawasaki disease. Um, and I think that very few kids are dying of this. Uh, you, you'll hear on the news of the, of the what, five, five or so kids who have died, but most kids aren't going to die if treated well. So, I don't know, you said you had some slides. Did you cover like the basic pathophase of Kawasaki's and what it is or no? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's kind of what this shows here. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen here. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, let me do this screen here. Do you see the screen? Okay, so just uh, let's kind of use this as a case, right? Um, if a call comes in and you have a kid who has fever, and let's say that we're in the middle of flu season and you know that type of thing, uh, obviously this, this should be a startling uh, picture to you. A, number one, because of how the kid looks, you can see just kind of, you know, just laying back there, his eyes are kind of sullen. And you can see the, the, the diffuse rash, if the, if the pacifier wasn't in the mouth, you would probably see very red lips, uh, red tongue. Um, and these kids are just super irritable. So the number one thing here is, um, is they have, they're tachycardic, but they're very irritable. So you, you'll, you'll never see a Kawasaki kid looking at you smiling. They're just miserable. And the tachycardia is, is out of proportion um, to what you would normally see. So look for tachycardia. So vital signs are very important here. Now, obviously where these kids get into trouble is here. So if you 
now have this kid who's two years old, you guys know that normal, at least minimum blood pressure for a two-year-old um, is 70 plus two times the age, that's 74. So this is low, right? The kid's hypotensive, he's tachycardic, uh, he's tachypnic, and he's febrile. Um, you know, obviously this kid is in danger. And so what you would do clearly here is um, you, you, would, you would get a line in and you would, you would give IV fluids. Uh, that's kind of the one thing we can do in the field um, to really help this kid out. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have antipyretics for these children, but I think where most people go wrong here, um, especially when we get into flu season, is that uh, most people miss the hypotension part. Most people will attribute the tachycardia to the kid screaming and they don't want to put the kid on a monitor. So when you look at all the data from the sepsis and, and pediatrics and EMS, very few kids end up getting a blood pressure. So uh, those of you out there hopefully know how to do a palpable blood pressure, which is basically just putting the blood pressure cuff uh, on the kid's arm, putting your finger on the radial artery and then inflating it and then letting the, you know, that, that pressure out until you feel a pulse. And that, that pulse, that, that pressure at which you finally feel a pulse is a palpable blood pressure. So you don't need a stethoscope. Uh, you should just be able to do this with your two fingers um, and at least get a palpable blood pressure. Uh, unfortunately, again, I, I don't know, uh, Angus, if you guys track the number of blood pressures that are missing in children but across the country, it's pretty high. Yeah, uh, not surprising, right? Um, so let, before you move on, let me just ask you a, a question for the for the sake of the, the folks watching. So our hint heavy book says normal heart rate for this kid is 85 to 140. This kid has a heart rate of 180. How, how concerning is that? You mentioned like some people might just tack that up to crying or whatever. His blood pressure is 70 palp and the lower range of normal according to the two year old page in the book is 75. So like right. is from your standpoint as a pediatric ER guy, is this like scary bad vital signs or like a little bad vital signs? Well, um, th these are not a little bad. These are bad because once a kid is hypotensive, they're already at the, you know, they're circling. And so why, why this is bad is because kids, unlike adults, they, they maintain their blood pressure until they don't maintain their blood pressure. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden they just, they, they kind of go out on you. And next thing you know, you're you're managing their airway and your and your and, and and most people then will go right for intubation, right? Um, and then you screw things up even more because uh, I'm not sure if you guys use RSI, but if you have a kid who's hypotensive and you haven't managed the hypotension part of it, and you go in and you try to uh, and then you paralyze the kid, you take away all their negative pressure, they don't feel their right heart, and next thing you know they're going to cardiac arrest. So I've seen many people make the mistake of not addressing the vital signs with respect to the blood pressure and the heart rate. You know, a kid like this, if you can't get an IV quickly, give them an IO um, uh, and, and, and give lots of fluids fast. Uh, now, obviously, what, after every bolus, you're, you're listening, you're feeling, or you wanna feel the liver to make sure that you're not um, you know, overloading these kids and making sure you're not missing some other cardiac issue. But for the most part, I think people miss out on giving the right amount of fluids um, I harp on all the time. Um, if, if you ever kind of want to drill down and kind of have a little fun with this, um, get on the mat and give the, and, and, and give everyone a case. And then you say, okay, the kid's 70 over palp and watch what happens. What will happen is they'll say, okay, I have an IV in place. And you'll say, great. And then they'll say 20 cc's per kilo. Now the danger is to stop there, right? What I would say is show me. And when, when people 99 times out of 100 uh, want to give this kid 20 per kilo, uh, which is 240 mLs, they'll do something like they'll have a 24 gauge somewhere, hand, right AC or something like that. And then they'll do this. They'll say, oh, I'm going to pressure bag, which is not good, right? Th this kid needs 20 cc's per kilo in 10 minutes, which unfortunately now most of us only have the push pull. And if, if you've never done push pull lately, um, I'll, I'll guarantee you, you'll, you'll never do it because what you're going to say to yourself is, oh, I'm right down the street from the children's hospital or from the local ER. And, you're, and, and, and then where that's wrong is they're just as bad. So um, 
this this is scary bad for me, especially in someone who thinks that the hospital is where this kid needs their care. Uh, we need to fix this kid. We need to get their, their heart rate down, their blood pressure up. And if you're going to manage the airway, I would advise, you know, just doing it with a BVM at first. If the kid goes out on you, OPA BVM, and then I would use a supraglottic uh, after that. But um, here it's more hemodynamics than airway every single time. So I'll stop there if anyone has any questions on that. So this kid, it seems like you would describe this kid as being really into decompensating shock kind of a scenario at this point by the fact that he's already hypotensive and we know that kids maintain that for so long then they crump all of a sudden. Can you do me a favor because you said something that's really important that I'm not sure is in the normal uh, thought process for these guys and talk about what you meant by palpate the liver. Oh okay yeah well you know what, what happens is that every now and again you'll get a kid who usually they're younger but they, they come in, they're hypotensive, and everyone's first inclination is just to fill this kid with fluids. And, and I would say that over 90% of the time, probably even 99% of the time, you can give the kids fluids and that there's never a problem because it's not really a cardiac uh, problem, right? Uh, they're not having kind of a right heart failure, if you will. Um, but then every now and again, you, you, you give the 20 per kilo and the kid gets, gets a little worse, right? And so they say, you know, let's just give more fluids, boom. So there are some clinical findings that would allow you to, to differentiate between a kid who um, is just has an empty gas tank, needs more fluids, versus someone who has, who has a bad engine, uh, cardiomyopathy, somebody with heart failure, like a CHF, right? And if you have a heart failure, the heart is not pumping blood forward and so it's backing it up. It's, it's kind of being backed up. And so after every time you give a fluid bolus, you need to listen to the lungs. Is fluid backing up there? You need to feel the liver because if, if the heart is not pumping fluid out, then the liver is just going to become enlarged and you're going to get it really, you're going to get back up there. So you have to feel for the liver. And so uh, if, you have, if you had an ultrasound, uh, obviously we could look at the IVC with the ultrasound if you're looking for fluid status. But um, my, my preference is to give a lot of fluids with the caveat that you should always, after every single bolus, you should do a clinical evaluation of that child or adult for that matter. So that, that's kind of the explanation of the liver just backing up fluid from the heart. Almost like a, a poor man's ultrasound of the vena cava for these kids. Exactly right. Exactly. Again, very rare. Uh, I'd be more concerned about that for a kid who's got like a coarctation of the aorta. Those kids present on day 10. Right, where their PDA was, site, was saving their life, uh, basically because it was a conduit. And all of a sudden on day 10, the PDA closes and now all of a sudden they, they go into massive uh, shock. And those kids, uh, if you just fill them up with fluid, they, they'll, they'll die on you. So again, not, not, not that common, um, but, I, but I will say that um, I'm always about the bedside uh, evaluation. I think the, the uh, the true EMS professional is even in the, the most chaotic of situations um, is, is always doing an evaluation of the child, not just visually, but if you can, you know, looking at their cap refill, feeling their pulse, is it stronger uh, after your fluid bolus, uh, looking at their mentation and so forth. Um, I'm a big fan of going to pressers earlier on children now than I ever used to be um, because I just think that kids need um, that, that blood pressure support. And I've, I've been wrong, I mean, you know, I've been doing this for 21 years and I can tell you that early in my career, because that's how we train, it's always give fluids, 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 and then finally end up at pressors. Um, I don't do that anymore, especially with the sick asthmatic as an, it's another great example where if you, if you RSI a child who's hypotensive, they're going to die. If you don't address their fluid status and their and their pre, and their presser uh, status, and so I I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm not sure if you guys do this of a push presser epi, um, and so I will I will go early to a to a presser in a kid like this while I'm getting the fluids on board, and I'm not going to surely wait for the hospital to do it for me because they're they're maybe just as bad. 
as, as, as uh, being fearful oppressors. And the kid ends up in the ICU, and by then it's too late. Um, and so what, what most people, Angus, end up doing with these kind of kids when they go bad is they do this with the BBM, right? And all of a sudden you're over, over inflating the lung, it's squeezing down the heart. So you have a kid who is hypotensive to begin with, not perfusing their brain to begin with, and then we kill them with the BBM. And so um, I would caution everybody that uh, knowing how to BBM a child and not doing it aggressively is probably your biggest, uh, is, is your biggest win and address vital signs before you intubate if you're going to use paralytics on these kids. So. We're getting off on tangents, but just because okay. uh, it's mm -hmm. my, my folks know that um, when we talk about the difference between a clinician and a technician, that's exactly the scenario we use to illustrate the point to understand what hemodynamic impact switching the patient to positive pressure ventilation is going to have. Uh, and my folks also know that I sort of argue with our local medical control board about how early to do pressors and folks. Um, and uh, so they, they, you know, want us to do some fluids first. Um, for my folks who are watching also, uh, we do have a draft push dose presser uh, protocol, which will be getting added in probably this year is one of the things that Dr. Antevi was just talking about. Um, so we do have one or two questions here in the chat for you, um, Peter, before we um, keep moving, hopefully, with the case. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned that uh, an IO would be appropriate in this kid. Um, so is this kid very sick? I think is, is, is yes. And would you, if you were drilling this kid, would you use lidocaine? That's a great question. Um, so we, we, we've, we've been down this path and I'll tell you, uh, for, first I'll answer another question and I'll get to this answer. Um, I'm a big fan of the femoral IO, the distal femur IO in cardiac arrest only. Um, I think it's a better place. The bone is bigger, it's thicker, it's easier. You can't miss it. Um, and so, so, so we have moved kind of strictly to the femoral IO, except when you have a kid who's awake. And why not give a femoral IO to a kid who's awake? Because if you look at your own distal femur, there's, there's a whole bunch of tissue you have to get through to get to that bone. And the, the, the plastic hub of the easy IO, as it's spinning in the drill, when it touches your skin, it, it, it creates a burn, basically a plastic burn on your skin. It doesn't feel good. Um, and so we, we found ourselves loving the femoral distal IO, distal femur IO so much that we ended up put, doing it on live children who are hypotensive and boy, did that not work out well. So, so I would say in a kid like this, if you're gonna do an IO, right? I would go proximal tibia, just like you would have, you know, just kind of how we learned in the past. Um, there was a recent study on the proximal tibial IO where they looked at a bunch of cadavers, right? So uh, kids who didn't make it. And obviously what would you expect in kids who didn't make it that, that you know, Either, either they were just dead and they had no trance, but it turns out a majority of those uh, kids had uh, maybe half of them, I have to look at the data exactly, it's been a while, but uh, that, that, this, that proximal tibial IO needle went through, went around, was nowhere close to the bone itself. When you look at how thin that bone is, especially in a kid this age, um, it, is, it is a skill that you really need to kind of understand that you can't just zip it in. Um, and so, and so um, the long-winded story is that I would say this kid gets a proximal tibial IO from me. Um, and if a kid goes in cardiac arrest, they get a distal femur IO, which is, uh, and we're actually, we're actually collecting our data. There's zero publications on distal femur IOs in children. Uh, we're, we're probably going to be the first one to, to look at it. But I can tell you anecdotally, uh, we're never going to go back from, uh, to, to doing that specifically in cardiac arrest. Hopefully that answers the question. Awesome. All right, we better keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you wanna keep going with the case? All right, so, uh, so basically just a, a review of what this inflammatory process does. And essentially what's interesting about Kawasaki, it is all inflammatory. Let's start with the top, the bloodshot eyes, very different from the kid who's got a viral conjunctivitis in that there's no drainage here, none, uh, because it's all just inflammation of the small capillaries. Same thing in the tongue and the lips. 
Um, the hands also, a lot of capillaries in the hands, swollen, the feet. Um, and again, the rash is just, in, it's just inflammation. And interestingly, when, if, you, if, if it's a boy um, and you look at the, at the tip of their penis, it's also inflamed red. So all inflammatory stuff. And then of course, the inflammation we worry about, because we don't really worry about any of this on the screen. What we worry about is the heart. Um, and so again, we mentioned this before, this is kind of the shitty name they gave to this. And uh, you can see here the clinical uh, findings. They all have a fever. Most of them need oxygen. Most of them are finding to be hypotensive. These are the sick, these are these sick kids. So again, give them oxygen, give them fluids and give them a transport. Um, and then you can see that some of them have um, a number of these other really just inflammatory findings. Um, then when they get to the, to the hospital, they all need an echo, EKG, chest X-ray. We do an abdominal ultrasound looking for uh, things like colitis, ileitis. Uh, we look at their gallbladder and so forth. Um, and then you can see they'll do CT. This is not really for us in EMS. And then there's just a whole bunch of labs that are all kind of inflammatory labs that, that need to get done. But, but we mentioned this already. This is all very rare. Um, there's a good likelihood that none of you will ever see this, but when you miss it and you miss a hypotensive kid, forget about inflammatory syndrome. Um, most people miss sepsis in general because it just doesn't look like anything bad because no one ever checked the heart rate and no one ever checked the uh, blood pressure. Just one last clinical pearl, like a pro tip. In the ED, what I do is when the kid's screaming, I put on the, I put on the leads I close the curtain and I close the light and that monitor is out in my workstation. And when I leave, everything kind of comes down and I see their true heart rate. Um, I would recommend that you guys at least have the kid, you know, put the leads on the kid, put the monitor on the kid, and then try to just try if you can to kind of hush them, quiet them, and you can get a, a true heart rate. Don't tell yourself that this is just a screaming kid who's in a, a moving ambulance. Um, and that I can't feel the blood pressure because I can't hear the stethoscope. Don't just don't do that. Awesome. And that, that's all the slides I have on this case. So. Cool. So a um, couple of questions here, and maybe I'll just throw in one or two things that I remember about Kawasaki's from before. So uh, the mnemonic or the, the saying in med school to remember Kawasaki's and why it's important uh, is that Kawasaki's kills kids coronaries. Uh, and um, uh, this is, um, for those of you with kids that are watching, this is why if your kid has a fever, the doctor says, hey, has it been more than five days? Um, right. So the reason why they ask you about how long the fever's been to see if it's been over five days. And if you have a fever for over five days that's otherwise unexplained, you have to start thinking about Kawasaki's. Now, in the chat here, uh, Peter, there's a couple of questions. So <laughs> the one person goes, so lidocaine? <laughs> for the oh, yeah, that's right, lidocaine, yes. Uh, I'm a big fan of lidocaine. I think that in the awake person, uh, you know, giving 0.5 milligrams per kilo of lidocaine, uh, you know, I, I think that, that should just be in your protocol. Um, it, it shouldn't be in the uh, cardiac arrest protocol. So the answer is yes to lidocaine, max of 40 milligrams to the adult. Awesome. Thank you. And then, so the next, <laughs> the next uh, one is, so if this inflammatory response slash Kawasaki mimic is COVID related, um, do you see any variance in symptoms or time frame uh, for a COVID mediated version versus a uh, naturally or wild type Kawasaki's? It sounds to me like this would be later in the disease course than maybe the wild type one. Uh, because that, in, in that case, you, you sort of see all this in the first five to 10 days of the fever, but in COVID, this may be sort of the second wave of disease. Is that what your impression is? Uh, the, 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 way, the way I look at it is, you know, and, and I trained in LA where it was like Kawasaki, you know, heaven over there, right? We just saw a ton of it. We, we, we never really knew what caused the Kawasaki. So we would always ask the parent, did, did little Johnny have a, a virus a month ago or a few weeks ago? And, you know, they were kind of all hem and haw, but, uh, but by the time the Kawasaki picture came up, they had the fever going and everything. So in this particular case, these kids are also getting sick that people think three to four weeks after the initial COVID, 
So if you test them by PCR, they're going to be negative. You got to test the antibody. You got to get a quantitative antibody test to see whether or not they have COVID antibodies. So where people have missed this is they say, oh, you look like you have this syndrome. Let me do a nasal swab for COVID-19 and it's negative. Well, yeah, it's going to be negative because the COVID wasn't, wasn't this week. Uh, it was probably an asymptomatic case that you had a week, a month ago. So um, I would kind of harken back to what I said earlier, where, where the, the cases of Kawasaki's from the SARS uh, virus from, from years ago, from 2001, um, it, it all just presents later, just like the Kawasaki's that we've always known presents later. No one's ever known what caused the Kawasaki's. We never had an, an idea of, of that. That makes sense. Because to me as an ER doc, I never know what the thing was a month ago that happened to the kid. I only know right. why that happened. And most parents just make it up and say, yeah, I think they were sick. But, um, you know, I, I have a nephew who has had Kawasaki's twice. So you, 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 can, you can imagine, and we have no idea whatever happened. We end up running all these viral tests. But remember, you're not going to catch the virus when the Kawasaki shows up. So now for the first time, we have this COVID ELISA antibody. So now, the, you know, I think this is going to be great information that this this is Definitely the result of a virus that happened about a month ago is what I'm thinking that this all has to be. Wow. So in, in what you're saying there is that actually the clinical course of this thing and associating it with COVID or SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually helping us to maybe better understand Kawasaki's in the first place. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. Sort of elusive kind of a disease that all of us learn about, but not very many of us see in the non-pediatric world. That's okay. super um to to see that that sort of uh side track to to the whole thing um another question from the field is so if we if we see or think about uh the the patient in front of us might be kawasaki looking uh in the field should we assume the cause is secondary to COVID 19 right now um and i, yes. I think the, you probably agree the answer is probably yes because 100%. given the the season of the year it is right now and what else is going on in terms of viral illness out there in kids. Um, but there's a follow-up that uh, to that, which is um, likely um, related to whether they feel like they should take lots of PPE precautions with that patient. Um, uh, that uh, is uh, a super question because likely they may not be contagious anymore, but my answer would be absolutely yes, go to full PPE if you see this. What do you think? Right. But listen, we'll be, we'll be talking about this in a year from now and saying, of course, these kids were not infectious with, 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 uh, with COVID-19. And you'd be right, but I would 100% with you on that. I mean, you'd be silly to say, to, to be cavalier, even though we're talking now and we're, and we're saying, wow, these kids have fever, red eyes, red lips, but they're not infectious. No, they're, they're not infectious with COVID-19, but you'd be stupid to take a chance on that. Uh, I, I surely wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. So here's another follow-up question, um, which is uh, um, they want to know why it takes such a long time before this sets in uh, following the original viral or bacterial infection. I guess the one thing we didn't sort of talk about is the actual, like, what is the mechanism of the inflammation? So I don't know if you can sum up the the vasculitis process real quick or whether that's I, I honest, I honestly, for as many hundreds of kids as I've seen with Kawasaki's, this has all been an enigma. Nobody ever knew what causes this or why it's caused. Um, all we knew is to treat it with aspirin and IVIG, make sure we got the echo. And so I think that some smarter people than us are going to have to figure out what is it about those particular children who get weeks later an immune response where their immune system goes haywire against their vascular bed. Um, and, and I, I honestly, I, I, I don't have no idea. Yeah. yeah. So for, for the folks watching, it's a, it's a vasculitis or an inflammation of the small blood vessels, uh, mm -hmm. sort of post viral or post infectious, but the exact mechanism we, we don't really know. Right. And that's why these kids get abdominal pain, right? So that, these kids get a vasculitis of every small uh, blood vessel in your gut. You got a lot of those. And these kids are basically having gut ischemia. And if you've ever seen a child come in with ischemic gut, 
these kids are like in pain, like writhing in pain. Uh, so pain out of proportion to anything that you ever would imagine in, in a child. Um, and I'll never forget a case where I had a kid literally come in by EMS and she was like a 10, 11 years old and she was screaming so hard. People thought she was like a psych patient and so on. She was having um, you know, mesenteric ischemia or gut ischemia. So look for that with this as well. Abdominal pain uh, is, is a big one here as well. Well, wow, that's super interesting. So it's actually the same presentation as like our old people that have mesenteric ischemia from their atherosclerosis. That's right. Crazy pain out of proportion. That's really right. Interesting. All right. So um, there's a couple other questions in the chat room that want to kind of switch the topic to testing. Yeah. Uh, cool talking about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I love that topic. Talked about it. But um, so... Um, Maybe this is a good opening question is uh, Josh says he follows you on Twitter and he okay. saw the most recent IgG was positive and knows you were back and forth on it. And he wants to know, do you think you did have COVID after your most recent tests? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes. And I'll tell you why I, I was sick as shit in January. I was overseas. Um, I was on airplanes. I, I was flying everywhere and I, I was in LA for like eight or nine days. And I almost had to check myself into the hospital. There was one night that I, I literally didn't, I couldn't sleep because I could barely, I mean, it wasn't that I was hypoxic. At least I don't think that I was, but I could not stop coughing. And, you know, and I said, knock on wood, I don't get sick. Um, and so I've taken a total of five tests. Three of them have shown IgG. The most recent one, which is an EUA, FDA EUA proof test. So uh, this week, actually tomorrow, I'm getting, I'm gonna be doing an ELISA test. I'll be getting quantitative antibodies on myself and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I don't know, but yeah, answer is yes. And thanks for following me on Twitter. I appreciate it. There you go. <laughs> so that was a good lead in to let's talk a little bit about um, the different types of tests out there. And this is something I wanted to talk to my folks about today too, because they know that, that we're getting ready to do some serologic testing on them. And we've been doing obviously nucleic acid testing uh, on them as we go through this. So I, I, maybe I'll try to st start to describe the difference between those two tests and what th that means and, and how they might be interpreted and then see if you agree with me. Maybe that's the, the easiest. Yeah. Um, the nasal swabs and in some cases the saliva tests uh, that people were hearing about, those are what are called nucleic acid amplification tests or PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, um, where they basically take a swab from you and then they put it in a machine that runs uh, what's called a PCR, um, where they are looking for certain sequences of the virus's RNA and if those sequences are there, they'll get amplified or copies made of them until the point where you can actually measure those or show positivity. But if that particular sequence of viral RNA is not there, there won't be anything to be amplified and it'll show negative. So that's, how did I do? Is that a pretty good description of what a PCR nucleic acid amplification test is? Yep, exactly, perfect, yep. Uh, you know, like, I like to call those a uh, direct test. So you're directly looking for the virus and I have the image on the screen here. That you just mentioned. Oh, awesome. So that's the kind of test that we all started with because that's all we had. Um, and there's some limitations to that test. Um, limitation one is um, false negativity. Uh, so there's a some percentage and you've probably seen um, articles in the news about particular tests and what their false negative rates were, um, and particularly related to the one maybe that they were using in the White House. Which is um, this one. This is the one right here. <laughs> oh, your, your screen's not up right now, but. Oh, it's uh, not. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, I'll, I'll, okay. I, I can do that. The Abbott test. Yeah, I'll, okay. Yeah, well, I, as you're talking, I'll, I'll share my screen. There you go. So uh, that's, um, yeah, perfect. So uh, that's a picture of the Abbott Now ID Now machine. And there's other machines that do that. Um, uh oh, we went to a black screen somehow. We lost yep. your screen. Uh, um, okay, I'll stop the share and I'll try it again. We saw like a quick picture of it and then it went dark. How's uh, that? 
Yeah, perfect. So uh, this machine here in the bottom left corner is the Abbott ID Now machine. This is the one that they showed at the press conference at the White House. And this is the one that people have been writing news articles about its lack of uh, sensitivity, essentially. Um, the thing with, uh, with the direct tests or the nucleic acid amplification or PCR tests, however you want to call them, um, is that they are generally very specific, meaning they won't turn positive for other viruses, but they are often lack as much sensitivity as other tests. So they may miss cases is what it comes down to. You may have false negatives with them. So that's what we've been doing because that's kind of what we had. And there are now versions of those tests that take an hour to run or even a few minutes less than an hour. Um, and then there's versions that take a lot longer than that. And the, the real holdup with those tests is even though it might take you know, six hours of processing time to actually do the test is the labs are, you know, only have so much capacity every day to get them done. So that's the first kind of test. And we've all been struggling with those over the last few months. And now more recently, we've begun to get what are called serologic tests or indirect tests, which test for antibodies or markers that you have mounted an immune system response to the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so there were there was, so there's a sort of a, a strange story with the antibody test that starts back in March when the FDA put out guidance that said uh, companies that are making these things can go ahead and rush them to market without meeting all the usual standard checkpoints along the way. Um, and uh, that resulted in something on the order of over a hundred companies bringing these little bedside test kits that you put a drop of blood on to the market, um, many of them based on very small sample size validations, and many of them somewhat suspect. You may have heard some stuff in the news about ones that Italy ordered from China that they sent back because they didn't work. Uh, so there's a lot there. Um, but basically, these are going to test for either an IgG or an IgM antibody to SARS-CoV-2 virus. And for just a quick reminder, um, IgM is the one that is turns positive early on, and uh, I remember that in med school. With Sorry, I was I was gonna get you that 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 uh, feedback. Perfect. Ah, oh, what a great picture. <laughs> um, so IgM um, is your uh, first antibody, um, and basically, I always remembered it like M for immediate response. Um, which was sort of counterintuitive because you want to say M for memory response, but it's actually not the one that does memory. It's the one that does immediate. Um, and then IgG, which is uh, hopefully a longer term antibody that sticks around and provides protection going forward. And as you can see from this graph that Peter put up, um, both of them take some time to turn positive. Um, the IgM tends to come earlier than the IgG, at least, and again, when I say to turn positive, it may not be that you haven't made them yet. It may be that there's not enough to test positive for. So when I say turn positive, I'm talking about the test turning positive, not necessarily your body just starting to produce them. Because your body can produce a certain amount of them before uh, you would show positive. Um, but um, basically there's a, there's a time course for these things. And so the serologic test is useful to know about prior infection and therefore make um, conclusions about the overall level of a virus in, in a community and potentially conclusions, assuming that IgG is actually protective, um, about long-term immunity. Uh, so like if you've had it before and you mount an IgG response, are you protected then from having it again? So maybe I'll stop there for a second, let Peter chime in on his thoughts on these things. Yeah, we, we, we've been through the same thing that you're talking about here with those, uh, those bedside tests. Here, here's what we've come to the conclusion. And we actually were the ones who validated the CellX test. And um, lo and behold, just like uh, Angus just mentioned, um, we actually tested 31 known PCR positive patients. So these are people who came to our study site with their PCR results said, I had COVID. And uh, in China, they had done their own validation, and guess what? They came up with a 93 out of 100, or sorry, 93 percent that it would, that this test would pick those people up. We found only a 68 percent sensitivity. So 
um, there's, there's, there's a couple of questions here. A, is it possible that the test um, over time, like so if you mount an IgG response and over time, and remember a lot of these people that we tested were 45, 50, 60 days out from their COVID. They were sick two months ago or a month ago. You know, is it possible that, that the test, as you see on the screen here, the IgG levels go down and therefore the test doesn't pick it up anymore. And so um, we also feel that this kind of uh, 15 minute antibody test, especially when you're dealing when we only know, we, we know that only like one to 2% of the people actually have coronavirus in the population. These tests function even more poorly and their positive predicted value, meaning that the odds of it showing someone who has the virus um, when they truly do have the virus um, is very low at this kind of prevalence rate. So I don't want to get too much into the details here, but these tests are not a test that you should be making any decisions on. So what we're doing now, we're testing 5,000 people three times at zero, six weeks, and 12 weeks. And what we found in Coral Springs and Davie so far is a 1% positive antibody rate. And we're going to test those same people in six weeks from now. Um, and then in 12 weeks. So what we've done is we are now doing the bedside antibody test, the indirect. We're also now doing, instead of the nasal swab, we're doing the oral swab, which is a direct test for PCR. Um, and now what we're gonna be adding in is the ELISA test or this, um, the actual, what, which what I think is the best test to do if you think you have had it, which is you send your blood to the lab, they get your result in you know, one to two days, and they actually measure the IgG in your blood if you have it. Um, the only problem is, so you have three you have three different things, the rapid, the direct, and then the ELISA, which is the antibody test I just talked about. Um, even if you have antibodies, we don't know what that means. Does it mean you're protected forever, like Angus just mentioned? So I think that we have a long way to go to understand, A, how to use these tests, but at some point in time, we're going to have to say, if you have antibodies, we, we, we may tell you you're, you're good. You're not going to get sick again, but no one will tell you that just yet. So a lot of data still needs to be done and to be collected. And uh, we're part of that process. I know you guys are looking at that same exact process. But I, if I had my crystal ball, I would say that, um, there, that the antibody test where you're actually looking for the actual antibody in the bloodstream with the ELISA test, the quantitative test, I think will be a way that people in the future from home will be able to send in your blood and get a result. So uh, we're, we're far away from that at this point in time, but we'll see where this all takes us. So yeah, I agree with, with everything you just said. And we had a plan to do broad-based serologic testing of every first responder um, whether they were fire-based, uh, EMS-based, or law enforcement-based, multiple times over over the course of a few months. Um, when we started seeing the performance characteristics of the tests, we sort of pulled back on that plan. And we've decided to do a validation study before we proceed with that. And what you mentioned about the ELISA is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take um, 30 um, sort of people who are asymptomatic and we think haven't had it um, and see uh, what the this what the little bedside test shows and and on that same patient run the ELISA and see the concordance and then we're also going to take blood from 30 known COVID patients in the hospital and do the same thing and we're actually also going to likely look at the time course between diagnosis of infection and um, turning positive on on the bedside as well as the level of IgG on the ELISA because we we have a um, a biobank of blood samples from from all of our COVID patients that we're going to do that on. Right, right. Uh, so that, that's awesome. I'm so glad you guys are doing that. Listen, if if somebody was asking me to come to their house and test them for COVID, the algorithm I would do today is I would do the finger prick blood test just to get that out of the way. If they happen to turn positive, I would say, hey, let's do an ELISA test. Um, if they turn positive for IgG, if you turn positive for IgM. I would do a spit test or a nasal swab or whatever, one of the, the PCR tests, the molecular tests we talked about. And so, you know, I think that there's a little bit of an algorithm. We've created one, I'm happy to share it with, with you guys, 
Um, I'm, I'm sure, Angus, you, you guys already have something similar, but every person has to kind of go through the algorithm the right way. And once we have all this data, the data you collect, Paul Banerjee is doing a 10,000 uh, person study with, uh, with Eliza. I think in the next month or two, because remember, my, my prediction, we're, we're in this for another year, right? A lot of people are gonna get sick, people are gonna get nervous, am I immune or not? There, there's gonna be in the need for people who actually know what they're doing on the testing side. And you're gonna see a lot of companies kind of coming out there trying to do people's tests and on the internet and all, it's, it's gonna become crazy. This, this topic right here is gonna be all encompassing in the next year. Because people, once, once this shit spikes, sorry for my French, once it spikes, you're going to get a lot of people who are going to want to know what their status is. And you're going to have to have people like you, Angus, and your, your department to say, this is what we think you ought to do. And that, that's kind of, we're, we're, we're trying to be those people here in South Florida. So. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. And uh, somebody in the chat mentioned um, the SIDREP viewpoint about testing. Yeah. Um, right. I will, I previously given them the SIDRAP link, but I'll give it again. You could just Google SIDRAP, C-I-D-R-A-P. Um, the latest post there is, uh, is, a, is exactly about this, about having a uh, logical, sensical, rational testing approach, which is something that we don't necessarily have at a national level at this point, let alone at a local level. Uh, I think, you know, we're still kind of muddling through doing the best we can with what's available, but certainly you know, there's still supply chain issues all over the place with testing and reagent. There's issues with things, you know, getting sold that aren't FDA approved. There's, there's all sorts of issues. One thing I want to just emphasize, uh, Peter, that you mentioned was the relationship between positive predictive value and uh, prevalence of a disease in the community. Do you have a slide of that in here or no? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't have that here, but I, I do have it somewhere else. Uh, let, me, let me just, I'll, I'll, let me unshare my screen real quick and I'll show you pulled up yeah. there. Let me just get it pulled up. Uh, let me find it here. Oh, here we go. I got one. Um, I don't know if you guys can, hopefully you can see this. This is just a quick one from MedCalc. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, math type stuff there. But basically, um, what this graph is sort of sums up the point that Peter was making, which is that um, the performance or what you can say about a test result in terms of what it means for your patient sitting in front of you is impacted by the level of prevalence of the disease in a population. So you can see here that if everybody has uh, the disease, then the test is performance is going to be much better because there's many more people for it to find. But if nobody has the disease, it's going to be very hard for that test to find the disease when there's so few cases. And that's a very sort of simplified version of, of the relationship. But I think it's important to note that, you know, we are seeing across uh, really the country, the maximum zero prevalence rates out of New York are like, what, 15 percent, 20 percent. I think I saw one that had it a little higher than that. But down here in Florida, the range that we're seeing in initial testing is anywhere between 1% and, you know, 8% maybe max. And that's in like the hardest hit areas. Most, most areas are sort of in the one to 2% range uh, for zero prevalence, which means it's, it's very hard for these tests to perform well. And any uh, lack of sensitivity or specificity is going to be magnified by that. Hopefully I explained that right. But, um, or in a way that can be understood. But I think it just, it illustrates the point that in a disease that's relatively rare in the population, that it, the tests kind of have to be better or work harder to, to identify cases. Um, well said. It's, a, it's a good point to bring up when it comes to trying to have a rational testing. Um, yeah, once, once we're at like 33%, then those tests will perform phenomenally well, right? Um, so a good, a good scenario where they would work well and where I would use them is that nursing home that suddenly has three, four, five, six cases, then you know that if you take that test into that nursing home, and that's what the SIDRAP paper, the smart testing talks about, where you have a high prevalence in that environment, these tests will now work well and, and, and the pro positive predictive and negative predictive value actually means something in the 90% range 
once you're at the 30% level. So it's, that's what's called smart directed testing. Yeah. I would agree, except for the fact that these tests can take, the antibody tests can take a long time to turn positive, 5, 10, 20 days. That's and if true. Outbreak mitigation at a nursing home, I really need to be doing direct testing to get people isolated. So there's right. a it's my, 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 my only feedback to there is that make sure you're doing a test that gives you a 24 hour turnaround time. The state of Florida is still doing testing that gives you seven day turnaround time. So we've abandoned that and we're, we've now kind of contract with our own people and we, we have a 24 to 36 hour turnaround time for those specific tests. Right? I, I agree with you on that. We're working with our hospitals here to have it done at the hospitals. I mean, you know, right. I work at the big hospital in the area and um, we're not the only hospital that has the 48 minute machine. Um, right. A lot of those spread throughout our community. It's a matter of supply chain for resources uh, for the reagents that people have heard of on the news. But uh, for my opinion, um, there's a, uh, there's a real need to be able to rapidly turn around the direct testing to get an outbreak in a nursing home under control. Now, it's interesting that the state is testing every single nursing home resident and staff over the next couple of weeks, which will provide us a lot of information about the baseline rate of infection in those states. It won't necessarily, I mean, it'll help a little bit, but it won't necessarily help mitigate outbreaks on an ongoing basis. It might help us catch a few right now, um, but it'll tell us more about um, how useful those or what the zero prevalence might be expected to be and how useful uh, those other types of tests might be in that population. So a lot remains to be seen about what's the best way to go about this. Um, but I, I think, it, I mean, I got a question just this morning about somebody wondering if they could use the, the bedside rapid finger stick test to screen people on the way into an EOC activation. And my answer is no, you really can't use this test for that because, you know, it doesn't, even the IgM, as you in the slide you showed, doesn't really turn positive till five to 10 days in. And the peak positivity rate for IgM is like 21 days into illness, by which point you probably are recovered unless you got the severe disease and you are most likely not even contagious anymore. So right. a lot of limitations here and, and a lot of false information about testing or lack of understanding about some of these really um, uh, slippery like issues. Um, a couple of other questions here. Um, Josh asked about previous SARS. He said, previous SARS, you have about one to two years of antibodies, right? Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be uh, the same antibody as the SARS-CoV-2 antibody. There may be cross-reactivity. I'm not sure we know the answer to that 100% yet. Hopefully the test is specific enough that it's this version of the of the SARS virus. Have you heard anything about cross-reactivity with previous folks who had had SARS or MERS? Yeah, so how these tests are made, I, mean, I, I presume he's talking about the, the, the rapid antibody test. Yep. And so when, when you talk to certain companies, the antigen that they're using in the test um, should be from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And those spike proteins look very similar from you know, SARS and, and maybe even other coronavirus in general. Um, but the better tests are using the antigen from the SARS-CoV-2, whereas it was reported early on, the tests coming out of China were using the antigen from SARS-CoV-1, which is you know, SARS. Uh, and so, so um, the better tests shouldn't have that cross-reactivity, but when you look at the package insert, they all say that you could have cross reactivity. So listen, I, I've called all these manufacturers, I've spoken to the scientists and they swear to me up and down that they're using the right antigen in these tests so that, so that they actually, so that the antibody that, that's in your bloodstream will pick it up as it's going across this amino assay. But I would say to you that yes, there probably is cross reactivity, but you would have to presume somebody had a coronavirus in the last year um, or they've had SARS in the past. And so, when everyone's having coronavirus and you get a positive test, um, you know, again, you have to presume it's probably coronavirus, but nobody really knows the true answer to that, in my opinion. I'm I've heard so many different answers. Yeah, I'm hoping some of the work we're, we're getting ready to do will help tease some of that out. Correct. But um, we're in process of pestering the IRB today to approve us. Um, 
So Shane, who is one of our um, firefighter paramedics who also works in a pediatric ER still, I believe, asked, right. what's the pathway that you are using for the pediatric ER environment and what tests are you using for them? Yeah, so we actually, we, we just put one out and I, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, but basically it's just recognition and then it's what we did for Kawasaki's for many years, which is we get all the inflammatory markers. We're probably gonna add on ferritin now because we, ne we never really got a ferritin before. But, you know, CRP, ESR, we do a urine. If you remember what I told you before that the, in boys and even in girls too, you get the tip of the urethra gets inflamed. Again, small blood vessels there. And so um, we, we actually have the kids pee into a urine, but normally when you do a urine specimen, you have either you use a catheter, which you cannot use because you're, you're, you're looking for the inflammatory cells. If you use a catheter, you're not gonna find it. So with Kawasaki's or with this disease in particular, if you're gonna get a urine, it has to be not a catheter and you cannot tell the kid to, if they're older to pee in the bowl first. It's gotta be the first urine coming out uh, in order to catch that. So, you know, urine test, the typical blood test, EKG, echo, chest X-ray, um, abdominal ultrasounds, but you know, uh, and, and, and again, all of that was what I really, I posted here, but the bottom line is you have to recognize that this is what you're looking at. Cause I guarantee you, you'll be in the ED during flu season and 10 out of the 20 kids in front of you are going to have a fever and they're going to have some, you know, other symptom. And you're going to say, nah, you know, it's not five days yet, or I don't see a rash, but it's going to be very confusing to a lot of people, but I would say just keep your eyes open. It, they're not all going to be as classic as you think they're going to be. And you get, th this is missed by a lot of doctors because it's, they're subtle. So just, just be careful. Just keep your eyes out. Be a clinician. Don't worry about the lab tests, I would say, my opinion. There you go. Uh, let us know in the comments if that answered your question. Um, Chief Tedesco, um, I just posted the link to the um, SIDRAP uh, testing viewpoint in the comments if folks want to look at it. Um, I, it's on my uh, list to read again through tonight and make sure I've captured everything out of it. Um, Chief Tedesco also asks uh, if there's any chance that you would share those PowerPoint slides with us. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, um, I'll, I'll share with you, Angus, absolutely. you could take everything I have, right? And also, if you look at EMS World, and then you type in my last name, I did a webinar with a, a public health doctor, uh, Rick Pescatore, which is a brilliant guy. Um, he kind of carried the load on that webinar, but that entire slide deck is narrated. It's, it's available on EMS World uh, for viewing. I'll give you the entire slide deck and you can do what you want with it, absolutely. Awesome, thanks. Sure. We've been going on uh, a little over an hour now, and we've still got about 50 people watching. Um, so thank you guys for sticking in. And um, let's, uh, any other questions or comments folks want to put in the comment, we'll try and address over the next few minutes. And we'll then try and wrap up because uh, I know uh, Dr. Antevi has lots of important things to do. That's good. It's all good. I have, this is fun for me. I was looking forward to this, actually. <laughs> We've been doing these a lot, and uh, um, I think we're going to try and continue to do them even after we're done talking about COVID in a year or two. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that um, at the same time that you asked me to do this, I got calls from San Antonio and a couple other places. It turns out that this kind of this type of learning that we've become so used to now on Zoom um, is 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 what's going to be the normal, and I think people are used to it and. I don't have to leave my house if I don't have to. And so not a bad idea. We're gonna, I think we're going to refresh uh, everybody on PHTLS over Zoom this summer and fall, which should be interesting. So everything but the testing will be on Zoom, yeah. I think. Yeah, we, we, we just we just created the whole Hentevi course. We, we linked up with a company called Prodigy. So we can do the, you know, the hands-on. I'm not going away from hands-on. You still, you still got to know how to draw, you know, medications up and push-pull and all that. But we, we've also done the same thing. Oh, yeah, just um, for any of our viewers that thank you for saying those words again, for any of our viewers who don't remember what push pull means, or think oh. of it as something else like using a three way stopcock. Um, what are you what are you talking about when you say push pull bolus? 
Yeah, so um, let's say I'll just give you a quick example. A, a kid, a one-year-old kid is 10 kilograms and he needs uh, 200 cc's, right? 20 per kilo times 10 is 200 mLs of, of normal saline. Um, in order to get that in that kid quickly, uh, you have a few options. If, if you're in the hospital, you can dial it in uh, to 1,000, right, or 999, and it still won't go in that fast. You can do a pressure bag and squeeze it, still won't go in that fast, especially through a 24-gauge IV. So what, what, what we recommend that you do is you take a 60cc syringe, three-way stopcock, and so you have basically the bag, syringe, patient, and you turn off to the patient, you pull from the bag, turn off to the bag, and you pull to the patient. So it's basically turn, pull, turn, push, turn, pull, turn, push. So you're pulling from the bag, pushing to the patient. There's a couple of problems with this whole process is that it's not, um, it's, it's not so sanitary um, in that a syringe was not made to do this multiple times because you inevitably get the bacteria that's on the outside in. Um, we in the in the emergency department have now moved to a new device called the Life Flow. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. It's created by a, a guy I made friends with. Uh, he's an ICU doctor who basically now it's like a squeezy gun that's sterile. But there is no way of getting 20 cc's per kilo in quickly any other way except with push pull or the Life Flow. And so even if you have a 10, 12 minute transport um, and the kid's hypotensive, if you wait until you get to the emergency department, they will not be fast at it either because guess what? They're not good at it either. So you owe it to the kid to get fluids in quickly. I would practice that if I were you. I can send you videos on that. I think I created a hint heavy minute on it uh, a little while back. I'll send you the link on it. Yeah, we have practiced that, and that's that's what we teach uh, here as well. But I just okay. want okay. to talk about when you said push pull because I think sometimes we just call it the three way stopcock method. Um, okay. Any other questions for Doctor Antevi? Um, last chance. The comments or the YouTube's a little behind us, so we have to like give them a second. But um, what else is going on down there in Broward? Anything good? Um, you know, with, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, uh, pediatrics, I would say what we've done recently that, um, you know, I think for me is my next, you know, big push um, is just trying to learn how to talk to families on scene at, at a cardiac arrest, uh, staying on scene. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of hell bent on trying to explain to people that um, the only way to stay on scene is to know what you're doing before you get there and then to talk to mom and dad while you're on the scene, not in a uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I'm so sorry thing, but really they want to know why have it, why are you still here? They're expecting you to leave the scene. You have to explain to them why you're not leaving at least for the next five minutes or so. So um, if, it, if I had one big you know, thing to, to, to ask everyone to do is uh, talk to people on the scene, let them know why you're staying. And then I try to push my departments and I got a lot of pushback to uh, call people after a death, call the families after a death, yeah, send someone from the department to a funeral, uh, send a card um, within the year of the kid's death. Um, and it doesn't make any sense. It's counterintuitive for a lot of people, but um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really you know, kind of convinced now that we, we have to do better when kids die. And so that's, that's kind of like the other big thing for me that I want to really make people understand if I can, so. Yeah, that's a great point. I remember when, when everybody was talking about an emergency medicine about keeping the family at the bedside while you were trying to resuscitate the kid and yeah. how real that was to have the family there and how uncomfortable all yeah. the medical folks were with that. I think there's a lot of that when it comes to the pediatric codes. Um, people are just uncomfortable uh, being in the same room, having the parents right there while you're working on the kid with every other stressor with it. So it's it's not surprising to me that it's it's hard for us to change that practice, but we certainly have been uh, been working on it. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll just make a shameless plug here that uh, a few months ago, I wrote this article um, and it's, you know, this is a touching article for me because the guy on the right side of the screen there, his name is Adrian Castro, one of my EMS captains at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. He actually did this on his own on a kid who got run over by the father. The, the father ran over the kid. It was brain matter on the floor. 
all of his crew, so the, the, the rescue and the engine who got there wanted to only transport the kid. They, they wanted to avoid the parents and rush off the scene. And it turns out that when you ask nine out of 10 EMS professionals, that's what they want to do. Um, and it turns out that that's not the right thing to do, but this is very hard topic. And so um, all I can say is, is that this requires some attention. It requires some practice. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, is that I got a call from a guy in Alabama that I, I, I gave a lecture about a, in February. He called me up, he emailed me and I called him back because I was so impressed with the guy. He said he went onto a scene of a 16 year old kid hung himself. He said never would he have ever talked to the family. He said that after they basically got this kid, they tried everything they could. He for the first time went and spoke to mom and dad. And he says as hard as it was to do it, he recognized the unlock in him and how much better he felt about himself after the fact. And so it's counterintuitive, but it's life-saving for the for the for for us as 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 caregivers, um, and so um, I think I think we just have to learn how to do it, and then one day you just do it, right? And then and then you're a better person for it. So awesome, yeah. tough stuff, um, but really important. Yeah, it's tough. It is tough. Yeah. Looks like we are just about out of time, and um, so. Uh, I guess uh, any last final comments we are going to do, we have two topics coming up in CME over the next couple of weeks. One is um, how to work in your PPE and how to communicate with patients while you're wearing PPE uh, so you can still have a, a connection with them. Uh, and the other one is, is uh, pediatric refreshers. Um, anything, uh, any, any last pearls of wisdom you think we ought to touch on for our pediatric refreshers? Um. The, for pediatric refresher pearls of wisdom, um, I mean, I think I think that the the concept, and I, and I hope I hope that I can come back and kind of talk more about this, but um, it's just a concept of, of closure on every call. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is is um, doing the right thing, even on the kid who's got the arm injury or the kid who's got abdominal pain. You know, there's a way of kind of what I call getting to closure on those on those cases, and so we should really focus on treating every kid like we treat adults in, in that same kind of uh, high level of care. And it just it's just another muscle that you have to use, uh, because I, I firmly believe now that how you treat every single patient, kid and adult, will really kind of show me the trajectory of your career. If you're going to be positive in your career after 30 years or not, all depends on a couple of things you can do on scene. Look at the parents in the eye, tell them, tell them that thank you, I'm, I'm glad that you called, listen to the family member, look at the kid, if, if they're old enough to, 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 to understand you, ask the kid what their name is, um, tell them your name, um, some very small things. Pediatrics is not complicated, it's just that people just don't do it right. And so, uh, that, those are kind of the small pearls of wisdom that are so obvious. They're sitting right there under our, our fingertips. But just people just don't know what to do because they're so scared from the outset. So that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. So uh, um, I want to, uh, again, thank you for coming. You had a bazillion people in the comments who are saying they really enjoyed uh, hearing from you and appreciate your time. And I, I certainly do as well. I appreciate you taking me up on my invitation to come chat with us today. Um, I hope we can uh, we can get you to do one of these again uh, in a in a little bit. Uh, I know you're super busy over there with everything going on. Uh, really, yeah, I can, I'll come. If, if people want to keep hearing what what my my opinion, I mean, listen. At home, no one listens to me. On Zoom, they do. So I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I'll be there. Thank you. thank you for being here and thank you for sharing all your information with us. Take care, everybody. Bye, take care.